Hello, I'm Robert Ellsberg. I'm the publisher of Orbis Books, and I am very uh, happy and privileged to be joined today by one of our authors, uh, Brother David Steindelrost, who is an Austrian-born Benedictine and is widely regarded as one of the most influential spiritual teachers in the world. In fact, uh, he is one of the few living authors whose essential writings are included in the Orbis Modern Spiritual Masters series, David Steindelrost, Essential Writings. Uh, he is particularly well known for one of his classic books, uh, Gratefulness, which has inspired a, an online uh, network, the Network of Grateful Living. Uh, gratefulness, he writes, is the inner gesture of giving meaning to our life by receiving it as a gift. And I hope we can talk about that because it enters into your new book. We're very happy to talk uh, with him today about his latest Orbis book, which is called You Are Here, Keywords for Life Explorers. He just told me he considers it his most important book. Uh, in some ways, it's a, a kind of summing up of the lessons of a, of a lifetime. And you say in the beginning that this is an attempt to look at the big picture, to, uh, to think about the question, what is it all about? A question that that is not just for you, but for for everyone, and not necessarily people who, like you, come from a Catholic Christian uh, tradition. So, you you describe this as offering sign points for orientation. How to first begin by figuring out who we are and where we are in the whole scheme of things. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what that means to you? Why this is your most important book? <laughs> the book is actually conceived as a kind of dictionary uh, of the most important words and terms in spiritual life. And it is actually arranged on the alphabetically on the uh, th these key words uh, the title of, uh, you are here refers to a map uh, on which you have find a sign that says you are here and <clears throat> In uh, German, the title of the book is Orientation, Finding Orientation, uh, a, a, a dictionary of spiritual terms. So what I tried was to uh, present uh, the legacy of my spiritual um, message of my insights in my life uh, in as succinct a form as possible and as easy to find so that uh, if your point is interested in this or that term I or you or uh, life you just look that up in, in the book but um, besides it's being a dictionary, it's also uh, there's a thread of reading in it, and these uh, 20 or so most important keywords are presented as a book in consecutive order. The rest of it is a kind of dictionary. It's an unusual book, an uh, yes, unusual yes. way of presenting things in a book. But uh, in your brother book, uh, not exactly the same book, but a very similar version has been out for some time. Uh, people have found that very helpful. You're you're really not uh, kind of setting out ideas so much as inviting us to a certain kind of attitude or response to our existence and the kind of big questions and the mystery that 
existence poses to us. Uh, am I right? Yes. Uh, I'm not interested in just uh, um, objectively presenting something. I'm interested in showing to the reader what has helped me and thereby in a way inviting the reader to follow the reasoning and by following the reasoning also following an inner attitude and uh, ultimately it is a confrontation with that great mystery at the heart of life that power uh, that empowers the physical and the mental powers uh, of of life that we are that we are familiar with, and uh, I understand that mystery as our great you, our great thou, very much in the sense in which Martin Buber spoke about it, the I and thou. Mm. Our ultimate thou is that great mystery. And uh, the idea that we can have a personal relationship to that mystery of uh, of life uh, at that very core of being, that we can have a personal relationship to that mystery, uh, which we call God, but that is simply a name, uh, that has powered uh, the spiritual life of most uh, ages throughout history. And we in our time have to a large extent lost it. And that is what I'm trying ultimately to recover in the book. Uh, I, I was thinking when you begin with uh, reflections on what it means to be a self, and it brought to my mind, uh, you know, Descartes' idea, I think, therefore I am, uh, which sort of emphasizes a kind of uh, individuality or separateness from everything else. Whereas your kind of uh, turn toward Buber and this idea that the self implies relationship, uh, that it is not separate from a larger reality, that we, I, don't, I don't exist just in my thoughts. <laughs> I exist in relationship. And that involves other people, it involves nature. But as you say, ultimately, it, it involves a relationship to uh, a, a deeper mystery. Uh, and so right from that beginning of thinking of what it means to be a self, you're drawing us into uh, a kind of a, a much larger reality than ourselves. <laughs> relationship is the beginning and the end of everything. Everything relationship. We exist in relationship. Uh, e. e. Cummings, the poet, said it very well. I am through you so I. I am through you so I. Not so good or nice or whatever, but I. I am through you so I. It makes no sense to say I, except in relationship to the you, to the thou, to the great um, um, you. And ultimately, we mean uh, that mystery, uh, not instead of, but within or every other you that we encounter. In every other relationship, there is the ultimate relationship given to the ultimate in the other and 
That is the great mystery. You write about the uh, things in our culture uh, or what you call the system that kind of thwart that uh, move toward relationship and substitute that kind of I it uh, relationship of, of the marketplace or, or, or whatever. I think that that is uh, you know, a very strong uh, tendency in our, in our culture, especially in the West. Um, I, feel, I feel a little bad about calling it a system because system is a beautiful word and uh, uh, many, many beautiful systems in the world. But uh, I'm taking this from everyday language uh, in which uh, when something uh, goes wrong, we say it's the system. It's not, and and that is the pejorative sense is what I'm picking up, and um, so it's not like uh, it's very important to me it, not to, if, for instance, in let's say in education uh, where so much is going wrong, uh, not to blame anybody but to see that the system itself, or let alone politics, the system itself has gone wrong and is constantly uh, warping our best intentions uh, so that we don't blame one another, but work together to change the system. Systematic change is, is what uh, is important to me. I don't what? know whether it becomes clear. I do hope this is this would be at the very core of it. I think so, and uh, I think that uh, obviously one of the uh, most dangerous ways in which that kind of false way of thinking enters into our consciousness is in our sense of separation from nature and from from the environment, uh, which has uh, tremendously uh, significant consequences uh, for life in the future and for our sur survival. And you, uh, one of the words that you uh, write about is echo-literacy uh, and how that enters into this sense of relationship. Yeah. Fritjof Capra, with whom I also wrote a book together. Uh, the, he is the one that invented the term eco-literacy and has done enormous work in the world to bring it about that people uh, are not ignorant about uh, the laws of nature, but try to uh, build uh, the whole life and our communal life according to the innermost laws of nature. That is what we need today in order to, uh, well, I'm afraid one have to say in order to survive. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite uh, little chapters in, in the book was on vocation. Uh, and, you know, we, in, in religious language, often kind of identify that with a particular kind of vocation, being a monk like you, uh, or being married as I am, a layperson. Uh, but you, uh, it's a very important word for you that applies to everyone. Uh, what kind of uh, response life is calling from us? Uh, how does that apply to all the readers of this book? Uh, I wrote the book uh, consciously for young people. Uh, as my uh, uh, gift to young people, and I was uh, always thinking of the future and, and how are they going to deal with life. And, and I often try to talk with young people uh, 
I'm very lucky to meet them here and there. Uh, and uh, vocation is one of the, of the difficult words for them, uh, just as much as commitment. So these words, I uh, uh, really uh, try to understand very deeply as being uh, a, a guidance. Uh, if the whole book is about finding orientation, then what you are called to, what you feel called to, is, a very, is, is something extremely important. And there is, in every moment, a calling that goes to you. Uh, at every moment, if you are really present in the now, uh, life is giving you something and is asking you for something. And what life is asking you uh, for is what you might call your calling, or your calling at this present moment. And most of the time, it's just enjoy. Look, I'm giving you all this. I am enjoying it. Enjoyment is so important in our life. Uh, look at the beauty that surrounds you. Uh, listen to uh, all the wonderful sounds that uh, are given to you. And, uh, and not only what you find nice, but everything and find what's uh, life-giving in everything, in what you call the bad smells and the, the ugly sounds. Listen to it, smell, touch, taste, um, all of life, this fullness of life. That is important that we don't pick and choose. We are not the, the masters. Life is offering it to us. And our task is to listen to it, to, to receive it, and to respond. One of the another great uh, chapters is uh, stop, look, and go, uh, and and how those fit into your orientation, your 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 lexicon or map uh, for how to respond to to reality. You have a wonderful way of you know that, that, as that is a kind of as a as a roadmap uh, for how to respond to uh, to to life, could you say a little bit about that? Um, I'm pleased that you like that. This stop look go comes, of course, from teaching children to cross the the, the street safely. Stop. We say we say stop look and listen this way. We we leave out the go part, but, but it's I think listen, listening is implied. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, stop, look, and listen, but then you have to go. That yeah, that's right. You don't just stay there. <laughs> because if you wait too long and then decide eventually to amble across the street, the too late. Late. <laughs> so stop, look, go is what we. I simplified it too, and uh, it is uh, the the basic pattern for a grateful living. And uh, I'm amazed that, uh, for instance, uh, I'm right here now in Argentina, but from Misiones, or one of the uh, provinces in the in the north. Uh, Indigenous people will come to us. We have a program, uh, this network for grateful living, and they will talk about stop, look, go. <laughs> uh, I'm amazed how many people in the world have picked that up and found it helpful for them. And it's so very, very simple. And yet, uh, if we stop because our life is so fast that we can't even be in the present moment unless we consciously stop and listen or smell or taste or 
um, look at whatever it is at that moment, open our heart, and then respond to life. And let's do that. Uh, we are not really fully alive. And that is what it's all, what it's all about. Uh, I, I guess a subtitle of uh, You Are Here could be uh, Suggestions for Coming Alive. Mm -hmm. Well, as as uh, the Buddhists talk about mindfulness, uh, and it is, it's not that we're not supposed to act, uh, but to be really present in our action and and aware, and so that the kind of exercise is a discipline of 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 waking up or being aware or being mindful or being present, and how that informs our action. Uh, rather than simply just being busy all the time. Exactly, exactly. Being present. I have, of course, uh, I owe so much to my Buddhist teachers, but it's the Buddhist teachers who have uh, brought it to us in, in a new and uh, exciting way, but it's there in every spirituality. The, the bottom line of every spirituality is be present in the moment, be present in the now. That's it. If you do that, and being present means alive, uh, and, and not just there, but be present with all your senses and all your attention, that you have made it. Well, you, you do lead up uh, in the book to one of your core words uh, through all your, your your work, and that is, and you've mentioned it, gratefulness, gratitude. Well, not gratitude, gratefulness, you say. Uh, how, how does, what does that, what does that mean as not just one thing among other things, but as a, as an entire foundation for responding to life and acting uh, out of that response? But I like to speak about gratitude or grateful living because it is a term that everybody understands. Every child can understand what it means to be grateful when you get a gift, uh, how you feel. It's a word that triggers an understanding uh, that distinguishes it very much from many other terms that we use in spiritual life or in teaching. Or in, it's it's a word that you say, "Aren't you grateful?" And everybody knows what it means. And at the same time, you cannot be grateful unless you trust in life. And that is the most important thing, that gratitude is known to everybody, understandable by everybody in the world, and implies trust in life. And trust in life is the essential thing for coming alive. Uh, and uh, many, many people, trust, all of us in a sense, Trust and don't trust, trust and don't trust, go back and forth between the two all the times. When we get anxiety, when, when anxiety arises, and in our world, in this world in which we live, anxiety meets us on every corner. Uh, we get from one anxiety into the next. This is unavoidable. But we can go trusting into this anxious, narrow, the word anxious and angustia in Latin, this narrowness, uh, narrow, it's, it's, a, it's a, like a, a narrow passage in life. life. Life's passage narrows again and again. And if we go with trust through it, we have made it. It's not a new birth. We come out in a new life. Looking back, 
we recognize that. But looking forward, every new anxiety looks like an impasse. And there is where we need the trust in life to go forward and no fear. Anxiety is unavoidable, but fear is optional. Fear means that when you see, when you get anxious, you say, no, 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 I don't want to go through this again. And you get stuck. This no is like bristles that you are putting out and, and it, all it does is getting you stuck in that place. And you, when you say yes, uh, the anxiety doesn't go away, but you go through it. And on the other side, there is birth. Just like we come into the world through this narrow birth canal. Maybe this is so important to me because I had such a difficult birth. My poor mo mother was in labor for 36 hours. Yeah. Of and uh, all my life, I have this uh, uneasy feeling towards narrow places and being in clothes and so forth. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but all of us, uh, except cesareans, I sometimes think they are the lucky ones, uh, have to go through this thing. And on the other side is a new birth and life more fully than we had it before. And looking back, as I say, we see that. Looking forward, we can't see it. And even our ultimate narrowness, that ultimate anxiety of dying, uh, we can't possibly see what's after that. Uh, if there's anything after it, I think it's not after, it's beyond, because we go somehow beyond time. But even that we can deeply trust that there is life beyond. Mm. Because all our life we have gone through one death and birth after the other. So why shouldn't the ultimate death be the ultimate birth? In your own book, which now is celebrating its 25th anniversary, and I'm so happy because when it first came out, I think that's when I contacted you. I so so enthusiastic about this book. One after the other of all these great saints that you write about, uh, and you you have a very wide notion of, of, of sainthood, not in the narrow confessional sense. Each one of them is a teacher and master of dying into fullness of life. Thank you for uh, a little advertisement. You're referring to my book, uh, All Saints, which I which did come out 25 years ago, and oh. uh, I was very gratif grateful uh, that you uh, highlighted, you know, many of of those stories on on your your uh, website. I, I think that you know you are, after all, 96 uh, years old now, but I, I think you've probably been thinking about this for your lifetime. And, you know, it's not a matter of so much what do you believe or think about what happens after one dies, but as you say, uh, having uh, spent a whole life uh, uh, cultivating a capacity for trust uh, and openness, uh, that it is not difficult to, to believe that uh, we can entrust ourselves to, to what comes what comes next or, or, or last in this kind of chronological lifetime? And as Benedictine monks, uh, we have in our rule, the rule of St. Benedict, he has a, a list of uh, actually originally there were topics about which the abbot was supposed to give talks to the monks. And one of those lists of good works is called today is to have death at all times before your eyes. But that doesn't mean some morbid preoccupation with dying at the end of your life. It means 
the death that every moment is. It's a death, unless you let go and die to the, this moment, you won't be alive in the next moment. Mm. So this uh, dying and rising, dying and rising, that is the theme of our life. Yeah? And Goethe had that uh, in his very famous poem that's also been translated into uh, English many times. And David White is one that uh, again and again cites it. But he speaks, and if you don't have that, that dying and becoming, if you are only a, a, a dim, a, a dim-witted guest on this planet. Mm -hmm. that, that I think is, of a. Uh... Of you know, Henry Nouwen famously, you know, he he wrote about the circus, uh, the Dutch priest, and he was fascinated by the trapeze artists. And uh, one of the, uh, you know, we tend to focus on the person who's flying through the air, but the trapeze artist told him, no, it's the catcher who is the real hero. You know, the catcher has the one who has to grab onto you. And it gave him this kind of thought that that's what dying is, is trusting in the catcher. You know, so that word trust again. Yes, yes. that was a, a, a very important image for him. Uh, uh, and it is for all of us because that was one of the things that fascinates us in the circus. Yes. Well, we're, we're, we're running uh, toward the end of my allotted uh, Zoom time. Um, I, I, I really want to thank you. It's been such a pleasure to talk with you. And I can see that this book in a way is a, a kind of a summation of, of the, the lessons that you've shared over a lifetime. And uh, such a gift, I think, for uh, young people. You, you don't refer really to uh, theological doctrines or, or concepts in, uh, in this book so much. But so I, I think that it's about a, a general kind of response or orientation uh, to life uh, that will be very, very helpful to to many people and a, and a tremendous gift. So I want to thank, thank you. Thank you, Robert. You have kind of summarized what I was trying to do. That's, my, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, we can talk for another minute, but I, I'm going to stop recording now and just uh, wish you well and thank you very much. Thank you. All the very, very best to you. And to the book, much success and to all your readers. Thank you.